you so much for joining us today for the first in our new series on U.S. global leadership. These are a series of bipartisan conversations with U.S. lawmakers, administration officials. They're really shaping the policy around global development issues. We are delighted to be hosting this here at Microsoft, so thank you so much for, for being our host for today. And also want to thank Food for the Hungry, who is our partner. You'll hear a little bit more about them later in the program. Um, but we're really delighted to kick off the series with uh, someone who maybe is a little bit newer to Congress, Representative Sarah Jacobs but she's not new to these issues. She actually has quite an impressive global development resume, having worked at UNICEF, UNDP, State Department, having founded an international education nonprofit. So she is very well versed on issues that everyone in this room cares about. We're really looking forward to having a conversation with her. We will also have a discussion with our partner, Food for the Hungry, where we'll talk about some of these high-level policy issues that we'll be discussing with the, the Congresswoman, but really how they play out on the ground. And then we will also reconvene for more networking time, so please stay with us. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage my colleague and senior reporter, Adva Salinger. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it is a pleasure to be here with you this morning, Representative Jacobs. Um, and I want to dive right in because I know we've got a hard stop today because you've got to get back to some important <laughs> business um, related to the NDAA. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to really talk about U.S. Africa policy. You have a depth of knowledge and experience from your time at state, from your other jobs in the past, and, and now as the ranking member on the Subcommittee on Africa and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, you've been to the continent four times already this year, mm -hmm. which is quite impressive. Um, I think you've been to Morocco, Benin, Niger, Senegal, Ghana, Kenya, maybe more. Might have missed Djibouti something. Djibouti and Somalia. Djibouti and Somalia. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to talk to you a little bit because in December there was this big sort of reset moment with the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. Um, and I'm curious how you rate the follow through of the administration. What are you, what have you heard in these trips? Um, is the U.S. doing things differently? Yeah, well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Great to be here with you all. Um, yeah, look, I think the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for the re-engagement with the African continent, and we are really seeing um, from my conversations with our partners there that, that they are appreciating it. You know, we've had cabinet-level, principal-level visits to the continent. Um, we've seen more people even talking about the issues and needs that happen um, in Africa, and I think it really is is um, changing the way that the, the continent views itself in relationship with us and really feels like it's a, a partnership unlike what, you know, has happened and really, you know, under the four years of the previous president, um, we really hadn't seen a lot of engagement. Um, there wasn't a lot of focus on Africa, uh, if anything, it was sort of forgotten uh, about. And so I do think this, this re-engagement has been really um, well received. So, so there's there's the trips, there's that high level engagement. But what about the resources? What about actually, you know, attracting investment, which was a big priority for African leaders? What, how do you rate the actual follow through on some of those commitments? The commitment to, you know, help support the African Union in getting a permanent seat on the G20. I know you recently introduced a related resolution. Where do we stand on some of the tangibles? Yeah, so, you know, the, the administration is working on this AUG20 seat. We have a, a resolution on it. You know, uh, they're, they're doing the legwork on UN Security Council reform that, you know, people have talked about for a long time, but I think this is, like, something where they've actually made a real commitment and, and are working to get it done. Are things happening as fast as I or anyone who doesn't work in government would want? No, but it's the government. Um, we are, but I, I do think that we are seeing new programs coming out. We're seeing new funding um, come out. Uh, I'm particularly excited about some of the shift in, in things around like the security sector assistance and, and, and changing how we do some of that. Um, so there's more work to be done for sure. Um, but I do think things are, are moving and changing. So I wanted to ask a, a key piece of that 
summit. And actually, just this week, there was a U.S.-Africa business summit in Botswana. And I know there was a high-level um, U.S. delegation that went to that. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the African Growth and Opportunity Act, otherwise known as AGOA, um, which has been sort of a really key piece of the U.S.-Africa trade relationship. And I think a lot of people would say it's probably imperfect, it maybe hasn't achieved everything it should. Um, but, but this week at that summit, some African leaders said, we really want an extension. And we're coming up against uh, sort of reauthorization of AGOA. And I know there's discussion. So take us inside. What is that dialogue like right now? We probably won't really get into more of the meat of it until next year. But what does AGOA reauthorization look like? What, in your opinion, should it include and should it change in some aspects? Yeah, I, I think there is broad bipartisan consensus that we should reauthorize AGOA. Um, so I don't see the actual reauthorization itself being a, a fight. I think it's more we're all trying to figure out the best way to do it. I think there are a lot of things we can learn from the countries that have really been able to benefit from AGOA, like Kenya, Lesotho, Madagascar, right? Some countries have really been utilizing it in ways that others haven't. And, and I think there's a lot we can learn about what we can do to help other countries get there. I also think we need to make sure that AGOA is reflecting the 21st century, right? So we do need to have something in there on digital, uh, the digital aspect, um, especially since we know that's a huge part of, of African economies, right? I like to remind people, like if you Venmo or Zelle, um, that all started in Kenya, right? M-Pesa was the first money, um, mobile money right, thing. So um, making sure we're incorporating those those aspects of it, um, and and making sure that uh, we are figuring out the the right way to calibrate it, basically. So these days, I think it's hard to talk about U.S. Africa policy without also talking about China. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a recent subcommittee hearing about U.S. Africa policy that was really dominated by a discussion of competition with China and how can the U.S. Um, help promote investment or help promote policy sort of counter to that. What is the U.S. model? How do you think that sort of geopolitical overlay is impacting U.S. engagement with the continent and development policy? And are there problems with that? Obviously, we're in an era of strategic competition. I don't think there's any way to deny that. I think one of the things we have to be really careful of as a government and you know, is making the whole lens of how we work with our African partners through the lens of strategic competition. Um, and, and I think it's dangerous for, for two key reasons. One is they don't want that, right? Uh, they do not want to have to choose. Um, they want the economic investment from China, and they want to, you know, keep working with us. And frankly, it's not in our interest to make them choose, anyways, right? Because that's not necessarily that they're going to choose our side. Um, but the second reason why that there's a real danger in viewing everything through the lens of strategic competition is that it actually then leads us to do things that aren't necessarily in our national interest because we're so focused on matching China one for one in every place or matching Russia one for one in every place. Um, and so what I think makes more sense is like recognizing that the African continent isn't is an area of strategic competition. What does that mean for what we should be doing? And I don't think it means we should be partnering with every corrupt autocrat because we're worried that they're getting money from the Chinese. Um, what it means is that we should be upping our investment and development game. That is very clear. Um, and we should be doing things that align with our values and are in our interests. Um, and that means really working with our African partners on the things that, that matter to us, like good governance, like human rights, like anti-corruption issues. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from how the U.S. engaged in the Cold War on the African continent, right? There's this often this focus on the short-term security interests. So we partnered with groups that we thought would be on our side against the USSR. Well, in a lot of those countries, now, 40 years later, 60 years later, populations and governments 
are still skeptical of the United States, right? So we basically let our short-term security interests actually undermine our longer-term strategic national interests. And I, and I think that we need to keep that in mind now because Africa is the youngest continent in the world, right? Half of, more than half are under 30. Um, and what we do now, the choices we make now, whether or not we partner with many of the autocratic governments that those young people do not support, that's gonna determine how those young people view America and view how they wanna engage with the world for years, decades to come. Um, and, and that, to me, is the big strategic competition piece of it. It's like, how do we win this long-term game and not let our short-term security concerns um, undermine that? And so from a practical perspective then, what are you hearing from youth, from African leaders about what they want? So it's not that, you know, we just want to do tit for tat with China or Russia, but what, what, what do they want? What can the U.S. do better? Look, I think everyone wants more investment, more attention, more development assistance. Um, we often hear from partner countries like, I didn't necessarily want it go with the Chinese, but they were the only option I had to get this funding for this or that. And, you know, frankly, it's not just that they were the only option, right? Sometimes the options we bring aren't the right fit, right? So, I, you know, we, the U.S. government was working with the Senegalese to build a road. We were getting DFC involved. We had a U.S. company who was going to come do it. It took three years. The financing never panned out. It was going to be this really expensive, like, Cadillac road when all the Senegalese wanted was, like, the Toyota road, you know? Um, and so I do think that there, you know, there is a, 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 you know, we do need to make sure that we are there and present and, and upping our investment and, and and upping our presence and engagement and that we're doing it with what they actually need. And I think another key piece of it is one of the things that we hear a lot from our partners, right, is like they don't want to be lectured by us. Um, and for a long time, Africa policy has had this kind of like remnants of colonial tint to it, right? We gotta go like save the little babies who are starving and we have to we have to go help, you know, help them kind of things. And so how do we recalibrate what we're doing so that it's actually about partnership and where we have some humility in it, right? Because it's not like our country is perfect. I mean, I just spent like most of my night arguing about all of the flaws in our country. Um, so how do we do it with some more humility and do it really in partnership? And I think a big piece of that actually is um, making sure that we're not just flying people in, dropping them in who don't understand the local context, um, that we're really recognizing that these communities, they know what they need. They know they just need the resources to be able to do it. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of work on trying to localize the localization agenda at USAID. Um, I'm really glad that Administrator Power has, you know, really made this a priority. Uh, we've had numerous conversations about it. Um, we have a bill uh, coming out that's going to gonna focus on localization also uh, and, you know, fix some of the things that USAID uh, needs to actually be able to, to implement some of it. And, um, but I do think this 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 piece of localization is key, right? Because it can't just be about giving money and then having a bunch of Americans come in who don't understand the local context. It's got to be about giving agency, right? Um, giving resources and agency. And, and I think that means we need to do a better job of figuring out how we are actually doing the, the development work, but then also how we're doing it in the field and, and working with local communities. Um, I wanted to turn to another issue that's a priority for you that you focused a lot on, and, and that's the Global Fragility Act. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about governance. Obviously, 
you know, you've written about that being sort of a key component of this. And, and for those who don't know, the Global Fragility Act was a law passed in 2019 um, that sort of laid out a new way to implement conflict prevention and stabilization programs. Um, the administration has finally sort of met some of the congressionally mandated targets. There are plans in place. But I'm, I'm curious sort of what's happening now. Are you actually seeing evidence in changes in the way that um, different U.S. government agencies are actually engaging on these issues. Some of the early tests have hit some speed bumps. So wh where are we now in terms of the implementation of the Global Fragility Act? Yeah, um, this is part of what I was looking at when I was in Ghana and, and Benin. Um, I also was in Papua New Guinea at the end of last year lo looking at some of this. But the plans took longer than anyone wanted. Um, and. It was slower to pick the countries. I mean, a lot of that is that the bill was passed in 2019. It was the Trump administration. The Biden administration had to come in, figure out where things stood, get the processes stood up. So um, I'm really glad we have the 10-year the strategies now. Um, and I do think even the act of doing the strategies has been really impactful in changing the way things are done. Um, so for instance, the strategies were really field driven. It was the, the embassies, the missions who were doing a lot of the work, um, which is for any of you who've worked in the government know, not always how policy strat and strategies get written. Um, but also, like we, like in the act of having to have USAID and State Department and DOD work together to come up with these strategies, they were having converse, they had to have conversations that they don't necessarily normally have. I know because I sit on both the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee, so I spend a lot of time being like, "You guys should talk." Um, <laughs> um, so, so I do think it's important, and we are seeing, um, you know, with how, um, especially in coastal West Africa, how the, the embassies are working with each other, it's really new, right? We, the, the chiefs of mission of the, the coastal West African countries that are in the Global Fragility Act, or in the, yeah, are in that grouping that, that we made, um, they're, they're meeting like once a month. They're, they're really trying to figure out how, how to do this regional approach. Um, and, and I think that's important. And I think that it has also helped um, sort of create this umbrella where you can then make some prioritization and hard decisions. Now, we also need to do more of that prioritization and hard decisions on our end, right? Like in Mozambique, I think 98% of the USAID funding is earmarked by Congress. So the strategy is all well and good, but they, they can't put the resources to it that they would want to. Um, and, and we're trying to work through some of those things. And, and I also think there is more work to make sure that the, the three, that DOD, state, and USAID are making sure that it's not just the small, like, stabilization funding that comes with the Global Fragility Act that's going to the strategy, but actually everything that they're doing needs to be under the umbrella of the strategy. So even if it is a health program, how do you make a health program fit with the strategy? If you're doing security cooperation and security assistance, how does that fit with the strategy, um, right? So there's a, there's still like work to be done to, to do that, but I do think we are really seeing progress and and even just by having a 10-year strategy, really seeing a change in, in how the, these um, uh, entities are operating. So you wrote last year about, you know, sort of the, the importance of good governance in these efforts and sort of the unintended consequences sometimes of U.S. counterterrorism support and how that, in some cases, it's increased violence and sort of undermined governance efforts. And so under the umbrella of the Global Fragility Act, how does this need to change? And I think, you know, we've talked a lot about Africa also, but when you look at U Ukraine and obviously the recent discussion around cluster munitions and sort of how we engage there, I'm curious sort of how you view the sort of idea that unintended consequences can actually have, you know, the sort of opposite impact of what some of these programs hope to achieve. Yeah, look, I think the Global Fragility Act is kind of the answer to how do we have a different approach to counterterrorism. So um, 
part of why coastal West Africa was chosen, right, is because we see pressure from the Sahel coming down. And we know that despite 20 years of investment in counterterrorism in the Sahel, violent extremism is only getting worse. And I think there is a real acknowledgement that clearly what, what we, clearly the approach we took in the Sahel was not successful. Um, now there's differing opinions as to why, um, but I think to me, the Global Fragility Act is the way for us to say, this can't be a security first approach. We can't shoot our way out of this problem and we can't allow our partners to, sh to try and shoot their way out of this problem. Um, so what, a lot of what the Global Fragility Act in the coastal West African states are, is doing is focusing on the northern parts of all of those countries and how you do make sure that governance is extended, that you're investing in the kinds of services that they need, that you're doing work with the security services and security sectors so that these there aren't human rights abuses, there aren't these driving factors. Um, and and I and that is different. That's a shift. Um, similarly, in Mozambique, right, a big part of why Mozambique was chosen is because we do want it to be the model of of how you do things differently when there is an active violent extremist uh, issue. And it, it can't just be about the security aspect of it. Of course, security is important. We know this. We know it's hard to get uh, development in places with that are insecure. But at the end of the day, what, what we're seeing these violent extremist groups do, especially in Africa, is take local grievances and use them. So instead of playing proverbial whack-a-mole, let's actually address those local grievances and make sure we are trying to fix some of those fault lines so there isn't as fertile territory for them to, to, to go to. Um, so we're in an interesting period in Congress right now where, um, you know, some, you mentioned the, the DFC, PEP, uh, uh, MCC is another example of agencies where Congress is really thinking about what, how could these agencies change? Should, you know, there's a proposal on the table to expand the number of countries MCC works in. I know there's some discussions about and have been efforts to sort of expand where DFC works. Um, and, and some of this is sort of part of that geopolitical converse, you know, conversation. But I'm curious how you think these agencies can and should adapt. Should we be expanding the remit of, of countries where they operate? Is there a risk to diluting impact? How can they sort of be engaged, these other agencies of the US government, in achieving some of these priorities? Yeah, I, I'm super supportive of the effort um, to reform MCC um, that Representative Castro is leading. Um, I actually think in a lot of ways the MCC framework is really helpful because if a country thinks they might be eligible, then they do things to be able to be eligible that are what we would want them to do, right? It's nice to have a carrot and not just sticks, right? It's not just like if you do bad things, we'll take assistance away. It's like if you can meet these benchmarks, you get more things, right? That we don't have a lot of that. Although we are thinking about how we can do that more in other areas. Yeah, they um, call it like the MCC effect. And, and there's a really interesting example with the DRC right now, actually, which has stood up a whole division within the president's office to actually try to, you know, meet the MCC scorecard so they can be eligible for MCC financing. I've actually been working on a story about it, but, oh, awesome. but it's a really sort of interesting example of how exactly what you're saying is, is playing out. Yeah, so so I think that's good. I, I do think we also need, and, and, and I do think DFC can be the answer to more investment that we want with a few fixes. I'm sure you're all tracking the equity issue and CBO scoring and all that fun stuff. Um, and, and we also need to protect against these agencies being used for things that weren't their intended purpose. And so I actually um, have been fighting against efforts to take to expand the DFC remit too much where all of a sudden you're getting sort of upper middle income countries getting investments 
and not the, the really lowest income places that was the original intent of creating DFC. Um, and I think we can do both of those things. I think we can protect against overexpansion while also doing the reforms and getting more countries eligible, but that is the balance that we need to be striking. I, I guess one question I have on, on that piece is, is there a need for some other sort of institution or capability somewhere else that could do the sort of more national security oriented investments in those upper middle income countries or even a high income country where there's a strategic interest in sort of promoting investment and bringing in U.S. investment, but like not then undermining an organization that has sort of development, not only in its name, but as a key part of its mandate. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and I also think it's not just about places, but industries, right? So like we go to all of these countries and we tell them not to use Huawei because they shouldn't. Um, but often there isn't an alternative that actually works for them for, you know, a few reasons. One is cost. One is that we don't have the same structure. So like it's 10 different companies who do the things that one Huawei does for them, you know, um, and some are European, some are American, right? There's no like, so I do think there is a need to think about in the sectors and areas um, that are important for, for national security, uh, what what kinds of structures, but I don't think that should be the DFC. I also think, and this is where some of the tension comes in, right, is on climate mitigation, climate adaptation, climate investments. Um, and that, I think, is where we need to not have DFC all of a sudden change. Obviously, we should, climate should be a, a big part of what it does still in the low income countries we want them to be working in. And we need to figure out the climate financing piece through what was done in the COP processes, through the sort of mitigation fund that's being set up. Um, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't cannibalize DFC for that effort. They should be uh, complementary, but they are two distinct things. So I know that we are running low on time, but I just want to ask one last question, which is sort of looking ahead. What's on your priorities? This is, you know, it's not the easiest time to be um, a lawmaker right now. It's difficult to get things passed. There's a lot of politics getting in the way of some of these efforts. We've seen that with the PEPFAR reauthorization, which has bipartisan support, but is sort of fallen victim to that. What, what, as you're looking ahead, what's on, on the horizon? I know there's a subcommittee hearing next week about Russia's role in Africa, but what are sort of the key benchmarks for you? What legislation might we see? What do you think we'll actually get through this year in this environment? Yeah, it's hard to predict because uh, we're about to have like a fully party line NDA vote, which is relatively unheard of. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, it's a wild time. Um, I'm working on uh, some some legislation around localization, um, around sort of changing the way we do things, um, security assistance. Uh, there's a lot of focus around critical minerals and how do we do that in a way that isn't just the same extraction process that has historically happened to African countries, right? Um, I do think there uh, is going to be a lot of focus on human rights um, and, you know, the, the, the fun thing about this is we can have all the plans we want in the world and then something's going to happen and we will be focusing on that. Um, but, uh, you know, we are also uh, really this implementation of the Global Fragility Act is going to be a huge focus of, of the, the committee and subcommittee as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us and, and sharing all your insights. Of course. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Hedva and Congresswoman Jacobs. Uh, I know you had a late night on the floor and have to fly back home this afternoon, so really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Um, really interesting to hear about localization being on the agenda. We actually have a, another DevX online event later today on that topic, something that we are covering very closely. Um, you know, we talked about the Global Fragility Act. 
And Congresswoman Jacobs mentioned the importance of you know, resilience and a paradigm shift. And I think that tees up perfectly our next conversation um, with our partner, Food for the Hungry, talking about um, how they are building in resilience into the work that they are doing. So I would like to welcome to the stage uh, DevEx Executive Vice President Alan Robbins, uh, as well as Safa Shaheen from Food for the Hungry. Thank you both. Great. Well, thank you, Kate. Appreciate that. Uh, Safa, welcome thank to, to, the, to the stage here. And I totally agree with what Kate was saying. That was such a fascinating conversation and uh, leads so well into some of what we'll be discussing. I'm just looking behind you because I'm reading the title here, but Peace Building, Resilience, and Fragility. Um, and there's so much here that she went over that I think we can dig a d bit deeper into. Um, before we do that, I just want to say thank you again to Food for the Hungry. And I will say, I wasn't planning to say this, but I was thinking when Congresswoman Jacobs was saying about you know, changing our paradigm of how we're doing aid and humanitarian. I really can't think of a better organization that's kind of done this than Food for the Hungry. Of course, you even in your name, it suggests like, you know, I'm sure you're still doing the humanitarian work, that important humanitarian work, but really doing so much around that development work now as well. Um, probably always have, but it seems more so now. And, and, and the partnership that we've been, been having with you is fantastic. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time introducing Safa. Um, but for those that haven't met her, she's the, um, make sure I'm getting this right, the Interim uh, Global Risk and Resilience Director. Um, and I think that what that means essentially is that she has more experience than anyone in this room about working in areas like peace building, conflict mitigation, um, gender-based violence in all sorts of areas. She's, she's from Syria, uh, worked in the mid Syria, the Middle East, Africa, um, and beyond. So, so thank Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, anything that you wanted to say or, or mention before I jump in? I've got some hard hitting questions for you. So, um. <laughs> Thrilled to be here, Alan. Thank you so much for having us. Okay. It. Great, great. My pleasure. Okay, let's start. Bao and, and Congresswoman Jake, as we're speaking about the Global Fragility Act. Um, and this act, the concept of resilience is one that we've all heard some of in, in, in different measures. Um, it's It really underpins a lot of what's in that act. Um, but it, it's not, as far as I can tell, it's not really mentioned much in it. Um, and it's sort of a misunderstood term. So can we talk about a bit about what, for, for what resilience is and how you at Food for the Hungry are, are working on it, how we should all be looking at it in, in our everyday work and looking at the future? Absolutely. Alan. So resilience can be understood as a dynamic uh, process that um, considers all different kinds of um, uh, layered and complicated and interconnected social, economical, and political and environmental kind of a risks. Um, by by adopting an, uh, an like a kind of um, cohesive and uh, approach to resilience, we could very much um, enhance the, the capacities of the communities that we're working in, the absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacities in which they can not only survive, but thrive and flourish. So as you have mentioned, um, Alan, we need to really take and grasp, uh, grasp all uh, aspects of resilience from the um, uh, the upper level uh, of thinking all the way to our implementation on the ground and in the countries. Um, and we need a paradigm shift in, in our thinking really into uh, really use resilience um, in, in, in a way that's rigorous and that's like grounded um, it, so we can really work through systems and enhance those systems within the communities, whether there are, you know, health or education or livelihood uh, uh, systems that could really help those communities to prosper beyond survival. Um, so that's like in a, in a summary and a just. Um, the importance of resilience uh, comes across really strongly um, in the aftermath of um, 
the earthquake that hit both Chile and Haiti 10 years ago, where we would see that the catastrophic um, uh, aftermath and outcomes of that uh, earthquake um, of, of in the, in the, like the uh, losses of lives or infrastructure was way less in Chile than Haiti for a reason, that their social, all of their social networks uh, were stronger, their infrastructure, their different systems, and the institutions that were providing uh, services were resilient. So we look at it, and this is like a perfect lesson for us to take in and, and really grasp resilience and integrate it into our programming and beyond. Mm -hmm. Great. And you've um, done a lot of work in, in Africa, in the Horn of Africa, uh, with USAID. Um, where do you see uh, that work? Yeah, what, do you, what do you see USAID? How do you see USAID and other, these other agencies fitting into that sort of global fragility strategy that we were talking about? What, what, where can they help in that area? I believe that the, the uh, US agencies, they really ground the floor for like resilience work through the, uh, where, where it's really centered in the global resilience policy. It's not really mentioned in the Global Resilience Act, but it's the central part of the global resilience policy. And it's very much addresses all of the uh, different risks on multiple levels, and then addresses those in a way that uses all of the capacities on a totality of like capacities of the US agencies in a way that address those risks on like the, the different um, like uh, country uh, level. So they intertwine and work really well together. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of those like risks that were mentioned, whether they're geopolitical or socioeconomic or even environmental, were highlighted in the uh, forthcoming um, USAID's uh, policy on resilience. And it, they really talk about those like risks and they talk about how to address them through strengthening different systems within certain communities. And as uh, Food for the Hungry, we do appreciate that a lot and we, we started to uh, really think about it um, in a way that uh, they, they inspire us. They also inspire, inspire the international communities by discussing a lot of the elements like conflict mitigation, um, uh, resilience and uh, sustainable development, stabilization. Uh, they uh, talk highly about peace building and reconciliation. So they, they think about the holistic approach and then she just mentioned yeah. it and I appreciated the localization. It is putting the communities in the driver's seat rather than approaching them from a top bottom kind of approach like she was talking about the savior um, and I'm Syrian and I know exactly what she's talking about. I felt it myself where a lot of like organization would come and impose something that might not really work for the communities and it undermines the capacities that are available and, and uh, within the communities, it undermines all of even the social norms and the beautiful things that those communities might bring them and bond them together and might bridge between the, the different communities and perhaps work ways um, that is good for good governance in a way that enhances the relationship between those communities and their governance bodies through linking is what we call it in the language of social cohesion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I really appreciated what Congresswoman Jacobs was saying. Just it's a breath of fresh air, really, that someone that knows the issues around development, but isn't just a development person. Like she, she links it to U.S. Not, you know, American politics. That's that's who she, who she represents. So it's just really nice to see that and the whole whack-a-mole concept and you know, making sure young people don't resent the U.S. All these things are just so important. Right. Um, so one thing. I've read some of your stuff. Uh, Safa is a is writes a lot of really cool stuff, and you can uh, pitch it if you want. I'm going to pitch one thing um, that you've written, which is um, called "Conflict Sensitivity as a Second Language in Ethiopia." You've done a lot of work, as I mentioned, in Africa, um, and just looking at that. Um, 
I read, I, I skimmed it. I'll admit, I, it, it's, it's, a, but it's a really good report. Um, it's, it's really good, and um, it's. You talk a lot about cultural sensitivity in that. Um, can you talk a bit about the importance of cultural sensitivity and and how we should be looking at, at it? Absolutely. There is like a, a, a very important element in conflict sensitivity and do no harm, which is like the substitution effect. We don't want to come in with our own thoughts and ideas and substitute something that the communities already have. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Why would we? And then if we if we approach them with something that's not suitable for them, for their cultures or thoughts or norms, then it, there, there's going to be a disconnect between us and them. And that really hard work of working on building trusts with the community will get broken. It means that we're ignorant. We're, we don't know what we're talking about or we're, the countries that we're working in. We don't understand the context really well. And that's, that's not acceptable at all. So substitution effect uh, works in, in two different layers. One is we do not want to really substitute what they have. And two, we don't want to be substituting any of the governance bodies and um, and uh, you know uh, grounded institutions that they have otherwise they will rely on us on the government on the um, organizations and the, the resources that they, they providing and that might tip also it goes back to tipping all of the power dynamics and everything within the community and other resources that might be uh, they might be like um, allocating for education and and health and etc might go to security and might go to like their army. So in a way or another, we don't want to be entering the cycles of violence and become part of it. Mm -hmm. And conflict sensitivity really helps us avoid that and avoid uh, doing that kind of harm, whether, uh, of course, it's in, in unintentional. However, we need to be very alert and aware of the implementations that we're, we're doing in that way. And for those who would like to learn more about this report, please visit fh.org slash resilience and it's on our page. You can download it. It's 52 pages, beautiful examples, and it has many, many tools. Yeah, I should have mentioned that this is a <laughs> Food for the Hungry report yes. that you wrote. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I saw some acknowledgments that some other of your colleagues helped to write it. Um, yeah, you mentioned Do No Harm and I read it in, in, in the report and it seems like an obvious thing, but there's actually a framework around it, right? There, yes. There's, I think, six principles behind yes. Do No Harm? You could do that. Yeah, okay. and, and I yeah. got seven. So we okay. do it at seven. <laughs> okay, okay, got it. Well, it's really interesting. And sometimes, um, yeah, when you really want to dig deeper into something, it's, it's great um, to see. So good governance, you spoke about that a little bit. Congresswoman Jacobs spoke about it. Um, can you give a, some examples of what of, of work that Food of the Hungry is doing or has done to address you know, frig fragility around in the short term, long term, taking in the good governance um, concept? Absolutely. In the short term ones, we have many, many examples, really. Like, I cannot... I, I'll mention a couple of them. So we basically had implemented close to 700 plans on disaster risk reduction last year alone, and closer to 7,300 um, uh, WASH, water sanitation and hygiene promotion activities in multiple countries. And we're, as we speak, implementing uh, close to $70 million as an emergency response in 14 different countries through funding and partnership that we have received or, or done with UN agencies and bilateral uh, donors. On the longer term, I have two examples that really grew close to my heart, to tell you the truth. One of them is working with indigenous women in Guatemala. We uh, work with them to, to help them overcome one, marginalization, two, the impacts of climate change, and three, the impacts of uh, uh, COVID-19. And how we do it is we engage and, and try to connect them with uh, private uh, sec with the private sector, with uh, different uh, markets uh, within the community so we can uh, support them socioeconomically. And we also do that through a collaboration with the government of Guatemala. So you, you see a lot of like bonding, bridging, and linking, which is like considered as part of um, uh, social cohesion and good governance. Um, the second project that we just started in East uh, Uganda, which is like brilliant, uh, we did um, um, some sort of partnership with um, 
cell tower company uh, to digitalize uh, classrooms. So we started with some digital classrooms. We we just took the, the few first steps into that project by uh, conducting some digital literacy with the teachers and the students. However, we're going to take that further into uh, using and and after the infrastructure of the digital is like uh, completed, um, we're going to take it steps further to benefit all of the systems, whether they are, uh, you know, education, health, and uh, livelihood. We're super excited about that and looking forward, like, to do it and, and to see the, the fruits and the results of those ones. Great, great. Well, we're almost out of time, but I do want to um, ask you about, um, yeah, you're Syrian. Um, it's very close to your heart, I'm sure. Um, would love to ask you a bit about uh, some of your, your personal experiences of working and living with the conflict there um, and sort of the role that society plays, social cohesion, other things play um, in that role. And I'm sure we'd love to close out just with hearing some of these personal um, Thank stories. You, um, absolutely. Social cohesion is far from being uh, established in Syria. It just, it breaks my heart to say that, but it's the reality. All of the international effort that was poured into Syria really only supported the bonding um, kind of effect and the, the absorptive capacities of the Syrians. We did not even go to uh, adaptive and transformative, not yet. And that's very hard and rocky due to the fact that resilience was not used. It's like always emergency responses, one after another. Some efforts to do some development work here and there, nothing to be mentioned, and really low uh, coordination between um, peace builders and uh, development workers and humanitarian workers. They're not really working, they're working in silos and not working together towards approaching one uh, specific um, you know, targets um, such as enhancing the social cohesion of their communities. It's very tough and rocky because once we look at like the linkages uh, part, enhancing the relationship between the community and the governance bodies, that's very difficult because you look at the governance bodies, whether it's the Syrian government or other entities, which, you know, uh, alternative kind of a governance bodies that were created in uh, areas that are out of control of the Syrian regime, then we start, um, we need to really do deep and hard due diligence to make sure that those entities or those individuals are not connected or affiliated um, or, or, you know, they're not even um, impacting the conflict in any way, shape or form. So that's very, that's very difficult and tricky. However, it's doable through the framework of resilience because we look deeper at all of the uh, risks and part of it is that the connectors and the dividers and, and everything, the geopolitical socioeconomic uh, risks uh, for each um, unique area and we, we could address it slowly because there, there's going to be somebody out there who's doing a good work, right? So we could also approach it through the resilience uh, work and, and go beyond the absorptive capacities or enhancing absorptive capacities capacities into adaptive and hopefully transformative and transform the situation because it's heartbreaking what has happened especially in the most recent event of the earthquake you look at it and people could not even wrap their heads about what had just happened and what's been happening for the past 12 years from you know, violence from the inside, dealing with radical groups and non-state actors, uh, being bombed by the government non-stop and external actors. Uh, you have the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, shortage of water, um, and then you have cholera that just outbroke also um, not too long ago. And finally, it ended up with this. It pushed all of the brains outside of the country and it, it forced people to be in this place or being refugees or so on and so forth. So you have those like kind of losses in terms of capacities. Mm -hmm. They're scattered. They're not getting together. It's they're devastated. They're exhausted. If they're the, the resilience framework and I look back at it and I'm like, I wish that some people have 
come together to look at it from that term or start implementing resilience activities from this point forward. So hopefully that the Syrian people will have some hope in the future to go beyond getting their breath into and surviving into hopefully prospering and flourishing in the future so they could have some future we're hoping yeah. so that's that's basically my thoughts around yeah. that and i think it's a it's a, a very important learning moment for all of the international communities and i wish that we could come together to learn from that one example so we could hopefully implement better approaches in fragile and other fragile contexts. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. And that, that's, that ends it on a somewhat hopeful note that, that we hope that it can happen. Um, but thank you very much. And to borrow a term I've heard you say, which I really like, is I appreciate you. Appreciate I'm sure the whole global development community appreciates you. And thank you very much. And I'll welcome thank back you. Kate to the stage here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Alan. Thank you, Safa. Uh, again, thank you to Food for the Hungry for being our partner for today's session. Uh, this is a bipartisan series, um, as Adva alluded to earlier. Um, sometimes my partisanship is a little bit harder to come by, but uh, in the global development space, uh, there is a lot to agree on. So we will be hosting another conversation with Congress in the call. Um, stay tuned for that date um, and partnership with Food for the Hungry. We also will be back here in two weeks for another conversation in this series with uh, Representative Ami Berra. So please join us for that as well. And then we'll be back in September with Representative Castro. So a lot more to come. You know, in both of these conversations today, localization, again, took center stage. We know how important that is. If you are subscribed to DevX Newswire, which I hope you are, you'll see that today's edition is all about localization. That's our final day of Pro Week, which we've been hosting all week, every day, digging into the five topics that are really shaping the global development sector. Um, so this is my shameless plug for DevX Pro, DevX Newswire. Make sure you're subscribed. You can take advantage of a great offer to become a pro member if you are not yet, where you can get access to all of our insider news and analysis. It's a way to really support our journalism being able to do things like this conversation today um, we are going to be around for a little bit longer uh, so please feel free to stay enjoy some more coffee um, food happy to to continue the conversation ability to meet with each of you um, and for those of you joining online thank you so much for participating virtually uh, with that we'll close it out so thank you all